Good morning. Good morning. How are you all today? You're pretty good? Very good. Excited to learn some stuff about WordPress? Well, uh, I'm Bobby Clark, and uh, I will introduce uh, the speaker, Wesley Lewis. And just to give you a little bit about, uh, about Wesley, uh, and after you hear my voice, the next one you hear will be Wesley. So. Wesley is uh, a Northwest, Northeast Florida native. I think he's from Palatka, to Florida. That's right. Where he's from. Big city. Uh, sure, are you familiar with that? Big city. That area there. Uh, he unexpectedly lost his job and attended the WordPress Jackson in 2017. This led to the bold decision to try to purchase, uh, pursue WordPress as a full-time career. He founded 180 Digital, a small but growing digital agency focused primarily on local nonprofits. Despite the trial of trying to grow his business while also growing his family, Wesley has experienced one of the greatest years of his life and wants to tell others about the beautiful freedom that can come with running your own business. Wesley Lewis. Uh, I'm really excited about this opportunity. You, you don't really know how much it means for me to be standing here talking to you. Uh, because really this talk is going to be part my story, part lessons learned. Okay, so really last year, and I'll just kind of get to the chase. Well, real quick, I'll tell you. I, like, like he said, he introduced me. Um, I, I started 180 Digital last year uh, after attending WordCamp. Um, and it's, we're, we're hanging out in Orange Park. Just a little more about me. I wanted to show this picture. This is my family. They play into the story. Okay, so that's why I wanted to show you a picture. This is not just a uh, just you know thing to get you to ooh and ah over them. They're very important to me. Uh, some other things about me, just just so you know. Number one, I'm a dad. Two, I'm a husband. I am also a pastor locally, but I'm also a developer, which is why uh, it's my full time job. So what I wanted to do is just kind of break down my story, exactly what happened to me last year. And I think maybe at some point you might be able to relate to some part of my story. Uh, and I think that we can go through this process and then I'll go through kind of six hurdles, <clears throat> excuse me, that I've had to overcome this last year that I feel might apply to you, okay? So um, I just want to start out telling you about my worst day ever. Last year, it was right after the first of the year, I went to work. I worked at a nonprofit for 12 years. I was executive director there. I'd done everything, ran everything, took care of everything. I went into work um, with a normal day, just expecting a normal day. Went in, normally we have our staff meeting, went in and had staff meeting. But this was a little bit different than a normal day because I had something exciting this year. My wife and I were expecting our fourth baby. And so I wanted to kind of let everybody know we were super excited about that. So during the staff meeting, I just was like, hey, uh, you know, I got some news. We're expecting our fourth child. Most of the staff there was excited about that, except for one person, and that was my boss. And so I thought that's kind of weird. Normally, he'd be excited for me. So anyway, he immediately after staff meeting went to his, his office, closed the door. And probably about two hours later or so, he said, hey, come down. I want to talk to you. And so I came down and sat in his office, and he broke the worst news for me, which was that they were going to have to let me go. There were some financial issues going on, and they decided that the best way to solve that issue was by letting me go. Now, there's a couple of issues with that. Number one, I was the sole income for my family. Me, that was it. I worked and supported all those beautiful people you saw a second ago. Okay? So it was all on me. My health care was attached to that. And I only had a few weeks to figure out what in the world I was going to do. So it was my worst day ever. It was really the day that my world kind of came crashing down. And I hadn't done anything wrong. I did my job well. I served my, my company well. Everything was going great, at least I thought. It just kind of completely caught me off guard. And even though it wasn't the best option for me, they decided that they would let me go. So my question is, what would you do in that scenario? I probably did it. That's why I'm asking. Cry. Cry? I did that. Stress. Okay. 
I went home, I cried, I left, went home, and I cried. I'll be honest with you, because I thought, man, i got to tell my wife this, and this is going to be a lot of changes for our family. What else would you do? Drink. <laughs> Go destroy some stuff, maybe? Okay. Uh, I, I didn't do that, but I, I was I was upset. And, and probably like most of you, I went and applied for everything. Okay. I was like, i got to find something now. I had some money saved up in the bank. But I knew I needed to find something as soon as possible, and I had to take care of them. So that was my goal. I applied for everything. I applied for government jobs. I applied for local jobs. I called friends. And the thing was, because I was, you know, sole provider for them, I couldn't just make minimum wage. That just wasn't going to work. It would take up all my time. I still would be able to pay my bills. So I had to find something that would work for me, that would enable me to provide for my family at, you know, at our, and we, we lived extremely frugally, but at a level that we were comfortable with. That just didn't happen. Okay, I, I worked out every lead that I could find. And not that the job market wasn't well, but I was in a, I came out of a, a job market that basically took an entire year to try to find another equivalent job. So I had a year, but I only had a few weeks of pay. So it really wasn't something that was pleasurable. But I say that to you that in that moment, I started to think about what was going on in my life, and I started to do kind of an inventory, a personal inventory where I started to think, you know, I had been involved in doing, building websites for friends and for companies and for people uh, for, for about 10 years. I had worked with Joomla, Joomla, I worked with Drupal, I worked with WordPress, and just kind of, I'm just kind of one of those guys who likes to figure things out and do things myself. So that came in handy, and I, you know, I, I thought maybe... Maybe that was an option. I thought maybe I have just a little bit of time here, so maybe I can just think about it for a second, that, that WordPress full-time is an option for me. And so it was really in that thought I came to WordCamp Jacksonville 2017. Without a job, without any income, without anything. And I sat in this room, and I listened to the speakers, and it was really in that moment that I had this, this light bulb moment that showed me that there are so many ways to make a full-time income with WordPress. It's just unbelievable. Because there were people here who were agency owners. There were people here who were theme developers, or they ran a blog, or they developed plugins, or, or made templates. There were so many different ways that people made a living doing WordPress. And it was so inspiring to me that it made me just really think, this is maybe this this agony that I'm going through is really an opportunity for me to do something great for me and my family. So as I left Word Camp Jacks in 2017, I, you know, I started to hear this kind of small voice echoing in my head. And it sounded a little bit like this. Some people dream success. <laughs> Don't let your dreams be dreams. And should be to or anything else you want. You're not going to stop there. So just do it. Make your dreams come true. Do it. Nothing is impossible. Do it. Make your dreams come true. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Okay, it didn't quite sound like Shia LaBeouf, but still my thought was, I think I can actually do this, okay? I think I can actually do this. I think I can actually begin to create, not only, or work towards the type of life I wanted for my family, but also be able to provide it in a flexible way where I could spend more time with my family. And so as I had said that, I'm like, I really think I can do it. So my journey leaving WordCamp Jacks 2017, I started 180 Digital, I started going through all these hurdles that I'm going to talk about today. And this isn't an exclusive list. I started kind of a, a, a creative agency. I know there's so many different ways that you can make WordPress full-time. And this obviously is not going to cover all of them, but I'm just hoping that maybe some of what we talk about today you can apply. Okay? But I do want you to know that it is possible. So if you're going a different route, maybe some of these hurdles that you, you're going to encounter will be a little bit different. But for me, um, this is what happened. So here I am a year later, 
Am I 100% full-time? I want to give full disclosure here. No, I'm not, okay? But here's the thing. I am almost there, <laughs> okay? So, like, I, I have made such progress in this last year that I'm almost there. I'm like, I'm almost there. I, I, I'm, I will be there by the end of this year, 100% for sure. And so, as things are growing, these are the hurdles that I had to overcome. So, the first thing I want to talk about, and this was an issue for me, especially kind of with the scenario that I had to deal with, is the first hurdle I had to deal with was myself. And simply put, I did a serious evaluation of me. Okay, I sat down, I made lists. I said, what, what, are, what are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? I had to know, because honestly, I wasn't going to kind of fully commit to this if I didn't think I really had what it took. And as I started to, to experience, you know, really what, what I had, the skills and the experience that I had, I started to think, man, I've got a bunch of administrative experience. I've got a lot of technical skills. I could code and I could design. I had some creative skills. I had this web development skills. I started really doing inventory. I'm like, okay, I, I think I can do this. I think I have the skills necessary to do that. So and I started to think, well, what is it my passion in life? And for me, my passion was to help people. I love to help people. If someone, if I do something for somebody and it helps them, it makes me feel good. So I started to think, well, what could I do that I could involve my creative skills, my technical skills, in, in, the, in the word of world press, technical skills, administrative skills, all those things put together that could really help people. And the answer to that question for me was starting an agency. And I took a DISC assessment, if you're familiar with that, which is a personality profile, a serious personality profile, not Facebook personality profile. Okay, But a serious personality profile where you can kind of help identify your strengths and weaknesses of personality type. And it was through that I really thought, I think I'm the person to start an agency. So as I started to go through there, I kind of asked myself this question, what do I have going for me? And I don't, I don't mean do a, do a serious evaluation so that you can figure out what your problems are. Okay, so Figure out what your strengths are. What do you have going for you? And when you feel like that, you start to really think, man, I've got some skills. I've got some, some value. I've got some things that somebody else wished that they had. That's important to realize about yourself. Because I remember uh, last year, you know, somebody was, was talking about, I was in a, a, a session of, with Jay Owen, and he was just talking to somebody, and they were just like, I hate to talk about money. And he said to her, you probably hate to talk about money because you don't think you're worth the money. And it was important for me to establish, am I worth somebody paying me to do something? I started to think, yeah. But somehow we have a tendency to become blind to that, to ourselves. So we, we don't think about that. We don't see ourselves that way. We think everybody else can do what we do. Maybe in this room, but not out there in the world, okay? They, they can't do that. So for us, when you have skills and abilities, identify what those things are. Ask yourself, what do I have going for me? The mistake here... The biggest mistake you can make is undervaluing yourself. Okay, undervaluing yourself. Once you figure out what those things are, you can do that. You can do that. So, yes, the first hurdle I had is yourself. I think for me, it, it was, I had to figure out who I was. And if I had it, go, had it for me. And I felt like I did. So, my first tip, I have a couple tips in here. Just know who you are. Know yourself. Really do an honest, ask people, because sometimes, not that you want to lean fully on that, but ask people, do you feel like I have what it takes, somebody who really knows you? Most of the time they'll encourage you and say yes. Okay, but sometimes you need some encouragement. All right, the second hurdle that I faced was identifying my market. Figuring out what it was for me that I was going to do best. I know I was going to start an agency. There's so many different things you could do, so many industries, so much potential work out there. I need to identify exactly what was my market. I need to define my focus and my niche and understand who I could relate to best. You know, it isn't about necessarily being exclusive to them. It's about identifying who you have the greatest potential with so that you can go out there and target them first. Okay, because if you were like me, <clears throat> I needed to make money. And I needed to make money quick, okay? So I needed to figure out who those people were <clears throat> so that I can do that. My dad is an avid fisherman. And, uh, you know, he, he says this, you, know, you got to know what you're fishing for. You can't just put anything on a hook and throw it out there. 
You gotta know what you're fishing for. And so I wanna identify, it's kind of a silly question, but what am I good bait for, okay? If I'm the bait here, who's gonna wanna, who's gonna bite at that, all right? Who, who's gonna want to be the person who works with me? Who's gonna want the skills and abilities that I have and identify that market? <coughs> So find the needs in that industry. When you figure out, maybe I, I, I'm, now for me, I had a lot of skills and abilities in nonprofits and understand how that, that culture works. So I knew that that was going to be the industry that I was going to primary, primarily focus on first. So I started to think about what are the needs in that industry? Specifically because I knew it well, I knew what the needs were. So I could kind of tailor what I was going to offer to somehow help someone else's need. Because that's it. You got to find somebody else's ache. You got to find their pain. Okay, what's aggravating them? Then you have to solve that. Now, whether that's a new website or graphic design or managing their social media, which for me, most nonprofits hate that. Okay, they don't like doing that. So that was one way that I was able to kind of offer a service to them that they felt was valuable. So I asked myself, this is an interesting question. What language do I speak? What, what's the language that you know well? Now we're talking about, you know, you can speak all kinds of languages, but in an industry, you know the lingo. You understand how people talk in a certain industry. You know the code phrases, you know the acronyms, you know all those things. What is it? That's a good way to help you understand what specific area or market you can go with. I started out this thinking, man, I'm just gonna go and try to do everything for anybody. And it was, it was too broad too early for me. I realized, really, by trying to do everything for everybody, I'm not really gonna accomplish a lot. So really, to kind of get going and get traction at the beginning, I needed to focus on this specific market. Another good reason that this was my market is I had a ton of connections. So therefore, it was gonna be the fastest way for me to get going, was hurtling over this, uh, my market and figuring out who that is. The third hurdle that I had to overcome was figuring out who my client was. So if I identify a market, that's a little different than who your market is. Because your market is your understanding of an industry. Your client is questioning who is really looking, specifically who is looking for someone like you. And for me, networking was the key to try to figure that out. I needed to understand you know, who was out there. And I began to talk with people. I had lunch with like a million people. I just started to get out there and put my name out there, give people cards, just, just get my stuff out there to the people that I thought were in my market to see who might be my client. You know, networking is so important because what, you know, work camp, work camp, there's great networking opportunity here. Get out there and talk to people and let them know that, hey, I'm trying to start something. And you'd be surprised at how many people actually want to help you start something. They want to help you and be a part of that. They want to see people succeed. So they're willing to go out there kind of on a limb, maybe recommend you when you don't really have a whole lot of portfolio, you know, and you kind of go out there and try to do that. So understanding who is looking for someone like you. Another kind of phrase, you can't build a base. Uh, we don't have basements in Florida, okay? But, uh, you know, if you were up north, maybe. Or, you, know, you can't build a business from your garage. We'll say that. we got garages here, okay? You can't stay at home all the time and expect your business to grow. Now for me, in my industry, that is true. Now if you're a blogger, yes, okay, that probably could work, okay, because you're just getting, getting content out constantly. But for me, part of me finding those clients and in that network was that I needed to get out there and find those people, go out and find them. And so I asked myself, who do I want to work with? Who is it going to be enjoyable for me to work with? Who, who is it that I understand, I can communicate well with, and I identify those people? And the mistake that I think is made sometimes in this place, and let me say, I've made these mistakes, okay? I put these up here not because I didn't make them, it's because I did make them. Thinking everyone is my client. Not everybody's your client, especially going to be a good client, okay? Not everyone can be your client. You know, you have to find someone who is just right for you. You're looking for someone that is looking for someone like you, who has a problem that you can help resolve. So you're the best bait for someone. Figure out who that is and go for it. Worry about, it's not that you're not gonna fish in the rest of the pond. It's not that, not that you're not gonna do that, but at least at first, for me, because I needed to get this done as quickly as possible, 
I need to define that person. So that hurdle for me was identifying who my client was. And I want to just talk about this real quick, about building relationships over customers. For me, as starting an agency, I knew from the beginning, partly from my experience with nonprofits, that relationships pay off again and again and again and again. Okay? Through referrals, through reviews. If I, if I work with my clients and I really intentionally build relationships with them, that's a two-way street, they're going to start to trust me. And then when they trust me, they're going to bring more, more work my way. I'm going to become their guy. You know what? If I'm their guy to uh, quite a few different people, I'm going to have a full-time income. So I want to become that. So I want to build relationships. So I'm not just going to go out there, find somebody, do the work, and turn it over. Now, I want to build a relationship with them, especially with WordPress. You guys know there's ongoing maintenance that needs to happen there. Okay? There's things that need to, need to make sure that you can build somebody something and send it off, but you know, it's not going to stay that way because they don't know what they're doing. Okay? <laughs> so understanding building relationships. So I just want to say this real quick, and we'll fly through this. What customers, they want it now, they want it for the lowest price, they're not loyal to you. But if you focus on building client relationships, like I said, it builds trust. They're going to pay it for it. They're going to recommend you because you have just a great relationship with them. They're going to give you great reviews. I have no problem getting reviews. When I ask somebody, they're like, yes, I would love to give you a review. They do that for me. So they go on there and they give me a review. Part of that reason I do that, and I don't want to take this for granted because building relationships is easy for me. I just had a lot of experience with that. Some people, it doesn't come naturally. My wife is an introvert. Okay, I'm kind of more of an extrovert. She's, she's an introvert. It's hard for her to kind of build relationships. So I just put this on here just real quick because I know it's kind of obvious, but I just want to make sure. How do you build relationships with clients? I really listen to them. Okay, I sincerely listen to them and I ask questions about the things that they tell me. I, I want to know more about them. And it isn't necessarily questions that completely revolve around work. Or, or the project. I'm asking them questions about themselves sometimes because especially when you're trying to design something for a client, you need to know about who they are as a person. Because you need to know that so that you can design something that really represents them well. So through that process, I get to know them, ask them questions, and I, I'm honest with them. I'm like, hey, I'm, I'm starting a business here. You know, I, I'm trying to get things going for my family. They want to help me, and I try to be genuinely helpful. I'll give an example every day. I was working with a marketing client. Um, she never used Pinterest, never used Instagram. She's all about Facebook, never used those. But she started a business, and I'm like, you need to be on Instagram and Pinterest, okay? Okay, and part of what she paid us to do was to set her up on those. So we set her up on those, I had to sit down and show her on her phone how to use Pinterest and how to use Instagram. Now, did I have to do that? No. Was that, she could go online and watch a video, sure. Was that in my contract with her? No. But that was me being helpful to her. Okay? When she sees that I'm being helpful to her, she responds in kind. Okay? So that's how I build relationships, just really simply. So you do those things, you're likable, people like you, they're going to like your Facebook page, they're going to give you great reviews, um, things of that nature. As long as you're doing good work, I say you do that and do good work and things will, things will be well. The fourth hurdle that I had to face was building a team. Because do you remember when I talked about understanding who you are, the, the first hurdle? Part of understanding that is understanding who you aren't and what your weaknesses are. So once you understand what your weaknesses are, you identify who you need. Okay? Because if you're not good at something, you don't need to be doing it. I don't mean that. You, there's things that, yes, you're going to have to do as, as the business owner. But at the same time, those things that you're not good at, you take up the most time. You're the least efficient at them. So at first you might think, I don't have the money to hire someone. I don't have the money to pay somebody to do that. I need all the money that I can get. That, that, that's not true. Okay, you need to find someone who's better at doing something than you are. Pay them a little bit to do it. They're going to do it faster. They're going to do it better, which is going to make your client happier. So understanding who you need as on your team. Identifying those people by understanding what your weaknesses are. That helps you to know, hey, these are the people I'm looking for. So through this networking that you're doing, you're, you're asking people. You know, you're like, hey, I'm trying to start this business. How, how, I got, how I got the people, it was through referrals. The people that work on my team, it was through referrals. Hey, I know somebody. Okay, great. I wanted to find people who were local. So I like to meet people, kind of meet them face to face, stare at them, you know, or something like that. So I understand who they are. 
make sure that they're a good fit for, for me. So I wanted to find somebody right around me. So I looked first. Now, depending on your type of WordPress business, it might be beneficial for you to look online and find someone. But for me, I wanted to invite them to do to be part of my process. Okay, I wanted to invite them. We have you know, meetings every Monday. Uh, we, if I have a client and I have something that's pertaining to them, I bring them with me and we go through that. It just helps me, to me, in my opinion, it helps me be more efficient and build a better end product. So for me, I'm trying to do what I do best. That's my goal. I'm not there yet, okay? I'm trying to do what I do best. And I realize for me, administrating, uh, orchestrating this whole process is what I do best. I've realized that over this whole year, that my, my gifts and abilities, I know about Illustrator, I know about Photoshop, I know about coding. Now, am I a pro at all those? No. But what I, I can understand, I can speak all those languages, I can understand the problems. So my gift and my ability is to administrate all that. Now for you, your, gift, your gifts might be different than that, but either way, identify what those things are, find people who complement that. Ask yourself, what don't I have time for? Now, this is a question I'm asking myself right now. Okay, I, as things get busier and business starts to build, I'm like, man, I just don't have time to get this done. I don't have time to do this. And maybe it's even something I'm kind of good at. But there's other things that are more important, like meeting with clients, and I want to be the person who does that. So I ask myself, what don't I have time for? And then I'm going to try to find people specifically to meet those needs. Now, I work with all the people that work with me are freelancers. So I, you know, I pay them well. Um, they're freelancers, so they're working on hourly rates. So if I need to pick somebody up, I can pick somebody up and find somebody. Mistake is, at first, I tried to do everything myself. And it took me forever to get projects done. <laughs> it took me forever. And I thought, that's not, that's, not a good, that's not helping my client relationship. That's not helping me be efficient. So over the course of me starting out trying to do everything myself, to, to, to realizing I needed a team. The fifth hurdle that I had was my process. For me, I'm, because I'm kind of an administrative guy, I love processes, okay? I just love them. I love figuring them out. I love figuring out how work flows together, trying to make things efficient. For me, efficiency is the key to my, to my organization. Now, are we the most efficient? No. But we're trying to get there, and part of why we're doing that is understanding, uh, trying to make work easier and understanding how I work best, figuring out my project flow, and for me this process is priceless because here's the, here's the cool thing about this, is that when I get better and I get more efficient, not me, me and my team, my, my company overall gets more efficient, if you're a blogger you know, you're going to get more efficient at doing your content and cranking that content out there, not only is your content going to get better, okay, you're going to get it out there quicker, and the quality of it's going to be better, so the people are going to pay more for it. So the thing is, the, the more efficient you can get in your process and, and delivering that better in product, you're going to spend less time on it, and you're going to get paid more. So I knew that that was a goal that I had, that I needed to make sure that, yes, I need to get projects done as quickly as possible as I can, but still deliver that best in product. And I do that, and so investing in that efficiency is part of how... You know, I've tried to get that, get that forward and keep that going. So this efficiency is crucial to keeping projects on timelines, understanding what needs to be done, when it needs to be done, when is it due, so that's not holding up other work, all those sorts of things. And we develop, we actually have eight, depending not nine, possible stages of development, and um, depending on the, on the project. And we work through those stages. We understand what, what stage the project is in, I'm a visual guy, and I'll say this too with my, our process, I'm still figuring these out. I, um, I'll tell you one thing, like Asana, anybody may all use, use Asana in here at all? A few people, okay. Then I'm feeling better now, only two people raise their hand. Okay, because Asana, like, I have this, like, I, I guess because I'm kind of a little bit creative, I'm visual, so I have a hard time using it for workflow. It's what we use right now, but I know there's got to be something better out there, so if you have a suggestion, let me know. But it's, it's part of my process right now, but I know it's not the most efficient. And I feel like I'm learning to do things the Asana way, which isn't what I want to do. I need, to, I need something that works with the way that I work. So figuring out your project flow. Asking yourself, how can I make things easier? 
And easier not so that you deliver a, a, a worse end product, but the easier for you so that you can be more efficient to deliver a better product. My mistake that I made was just talking to everybody, how do you do this, how do you do this? Okay, I got started, I subscribed to stuff that I did not need, okay? And, <laughs> okay, you use this, okay, I, I, I was subscribed, sign up for it, use it for a few months, I'm like, man, I don't, why, why did I use this? I'm not, I haven't touched this in like two or three months. So I would cancel that. I, I started doing things like everyone else. That's not how you're going to work. So figure out how you work and what your process is. This is something that I had to learn. Don't let learning hinder doing. Don't let your learning hinder doing. For me, I knew, like I said, I started out trying to do everything myself. I'm like, man, I have so much stuff to learn. I have so much stuff. So I signed up on like, uh, you know, Code Academy and this class and that class. I had some cash, you know, so I was trying to invest in my business. But I realized I'm sitting here doing all this work. I'm not, I'm doing all this learning, but I'm not doing any work. If I'm not doing work, then I'm not making money. So I need to balance this learning and doing together. So don't let your learning hinder your doing. And I find that this is true. I, I went to school straight through. I was seven years through school, okay, master's degree, all this kind of stuff. And there was guys that were there with me who were working. And they had they took them twice as long to do it. But they knew what they wanted to do. And so I feel like for me, when I go back and I take a class for something, I don't know specifically exactly what kind of class I want to take and how it's going to help me, how it's going to benefit me, how it's going to make me more efficient. So don't let your learning hinder your doing. The last hurdle is pricing. So I did all those things. I realized who I was, who my market is, who my client is, who uh, my team's going to be, what my process is going to look like, how much that's going to cost me and everything. And ultimately, uh, I came to, okay, now what do I need to charge? How do I need to deal with that price? Well, just from my experience, the number one thing that you're selling is yourself. The number one thing that you're selling is you. So if you go to talk to someone and you're able to make them comfortable with who you are, whether that's over the phone or in person, they'll be much more likely to go with you. Why? Because I had clients come to me, they got proposals and they talk to people over the phone. I like to set up a consultation first up. Before I tell someone what their, what their price is going to be, I like to meet them face to face. Yes, that takes up more time for me. But it helps me establish that relationship with that client. So I like to, to get to meet with them, and I talk to them. I tell them about myself, like, hey, I'm a dad. I'm a normal person, okay? I'm, I'm you know, I, I'm, I'm a regular guy, but this is my job. This is what I do. And I find that when I, when I present myself in that way, people are more apt to go with me, even if I do charge a little bit more than other people. Other thing, don't be afraid to talk about money. People are coming to, to, to talk to you. They are expecting you to give them a number. So don't be afraid to talk about it. And think, like I said earlier, as you get better, you can charge more. What I charged a year ago, uh, what I charge now is much more than what I charged a year ago. But I knew I needed to get something started. I knew I needed to kind of get the ball rolling. And I wasn't as efficient back then. I wasn't as good as I am now. So I, I realized that as I got better, I could charge more because my end product is going to be better. Now, because I work in the world of nonprofits who don't typically have very much money, there's a ceiling there. I know that. But I'm able to say, here I am, not just as some guy who works out of his house who can build a website, but I'm an agency who has graphic designers and developers and marketers. I'm able to give you a better in product, a better solution to your problem. Now, I can charge them more. And also, when you're thinking about your pricing, think about your long-term goals. For me, I knew that I wanted to provide an income for my family. I had done lots of reading, and one thing that I, I knew that I needed to do was establish recurring income. And depending on your type of WordPress business, especially in kind of a creative agency, um, you know, you're, you're just hopping from one project to another, and there's kind of a feast or famine cycle that goes along with that. And I read enough to know that from the beginning, I wanted to work on those relationships with the clients so that I can have that reoccurring revenue, so that I can establish relationships with them. So I'm not broke all the time. 
And even still, over this last year, yeah, it's like a roller coaster, okay? <laughs> I get paid at the beginning, but then I don't get paid the rest of it until I finish a project. And I'm like, man, I gotta get this project done because I need to get paid. But understanding what your pricing is by knowing what your process is, what your team is, what your skills and abilities are, all those things play into what you're able to ask. Now, yeah, find, figure out what everybody else is doing, figure out what the going rate is. But if you're just starting out, you're not gonna be able to ask that. You're not gonna be able to ask that, but figure out what that is to set yourself a goal to say, I wanna be here. And get there, you can do it. And really for me, the question I ask myself in this whole process is really, how can I bring value or more value to my clients? How can I bring them a better value? Not just, you know, they're going to pay me, but what, how can I give them more for their money? Yeah, I'm going to start asking for more money, but I need to give more when I do ask for more money. I need to give a better product. The mistake commonly made is just not talking about money, being apprehensive about talking about it. Now let me say this, when I meet with a client, I don't just... I hear about their project, I want to know what they're really looking for, what are they hoping to accomplish with that. That all helps me to build that relationship with them. And then I don't give them a price for that consultation. I, I think about what they're saying. I kind of use a more value-based pricing strategy. I hear them, I talk to them, I get to know them, understand how this project is going to benefit them, then I go back and do a proposal and I send it to them. And then I talk, talk over it with them. I learned this. Never do anything for free. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I should put a little, little asterisk there, but free doesn't mean for not any money. Okay. You can do things where your, your payment isn't necessarily uh, money. Maybe it's a referral. Maybe you feel like it's going to be good for your portfolio. Maybe it's going to be good experience for you. Maybe just know how something is going to benefit you. <laughs> Have an understanding from the, from the, from the get-go that this is going to benefit me this way. This is going to benefit me you know, exactly how, whether that's going to be just great experience for you. you know, I, have, I have a few projects right now I'm, I'm doing for free. And the reason I'm doing them for free is because I need to add them to my portfolio. And they're not a lot of work. I can kind of do it in my spare time. But for me, it helps give me credibility into an industry, specifically kind of growing outside of my nonprofit kind of market. I might, might invest in a project for, for lower amount or almost free or something like that to understand. Now, I'm, I'm also usually get some recurring revenue from that, so I don't actually do it completely for free. But it kind of helps introduce me to a sector. It helps me introduce me to a new thing. So just, just some ways for developing recurring revenue. Each one of these, says each one of these hurdles could be a whole session in and of itself. Absolutely. Especially this one. Okay. And maybe, maybe next year I'll have more insight into this and I'll, I'll give you some more. How do I do that? Through retainers, number one. Developing ongoing relationships with those clients, whether that's maintaining their website, supporting it. Uh, we do graphic design retainers, marketing retainers, social media support retainers. We package all that together. We do a lot of that kind of stuff so we can really help our clients. Whatever their problem is, Typically, we can help them with that. Not that y'all can read that. That text is kind of small there. But understanding uh, that these are relationships. So from the beginning, I knew I wanted to establish retainers. I knew I wanted to offer them. I knew I wanted to price them. Hosting. This is something that I do. Um, and this is something that, I, that I've created. But it's something I've partnered with uh, an existing host. Um, you could use like Titan Host here. You could talk with... Uh, I use DreamHost as one of the sponsors. Uh, they have some WordPress optimized hosting. And here's what I do. I, I offer that to my clients. I manage it for them. I maintain it for them. I, I install premium plugins on there for them. So I offer them a, a value-added service that they appreciate, that they're going to get for less than if they were to try to go out there and get it themselves. And then the last way, and I kind of call this my icing on the cake, because if you get these other two things going on, and then you have these other projects, but repeat business. Somebody comes back to me again, I know this maybe isn't reoccurring technically, but repeat business, when somebody comes back to me and I just did a great project for them, and they have a little bit of something extra. Like, hey, can you design this project, or can you design this, this booklet for me? Hey, can you, can you do this and kind of maybe optimize this social media post for me? Sure. Okay, sure I can. I've established a relationship for them, so they're going to come back if they have any needs. 
And I've already established a pricing structure with them so they know how much it's going to cost. And the great thing for me is that's like icing on the cake, okay? That's like extra money that I can figure out what to do with. Um, so for me, those are some of the keys to long-term success is developing that reoccurring revenue. And that's very important. So I just want to kind of in conclusion say this. In reality, the reality is that you can do WordPress full-time. And I will stand here and say I am, like I said, I'm not complete there, but I'm almost there. In one year, going from not having a job to deciding to do WordPress to starting an agency to going through all those hurdles, okay, it is a process and it'll take you some time, but it can be done. And what I love is that there's so many ways to do it. There's just so, with WordPress, there's so much flexibility there with ways that you can make WordPress your full-time income. But let me say this, part of, part of what I do um, for me is I, I love spending time with my kids. I love being at home. Um, I love the flexibility that comes with me doing WordPress full-time. I make my own schedule. I take projects or I don't take projects or I delay projects according to my schedule. And that's great, okay, for me because I want to spend as much time as I can with my family. So you can do it and it can be the best thing. So for me, my journey over this last year started kind of in agony. But I would not change it for anything, okay? Because this year, not only am I happier, I'm better, okay? Maybe my income isn't quite what it used to be or quite where it's going to be, though. Okay, it's not quite there yet. But, but it will be, and I'm sure of that. But for me, I, I have existed in this world of WordPress for this last year, just full-time, uh, guns blazing, and it has been the best year of my life. So I want to encourage you all to do the same. If you're there, if you're on the fence like me, probably not. Most of you guys in here are probably already doing this. <laughs> but for me, if you're on the fence, it can be done. And if you need some help, you need some coaching, I, like I said, I'm just kind of, maybe I'm a few hurdles ahead of you. I'd be happy to help you any way that I can. But you can do it. So I appreciate y'all how let me have this opportunity to speak this morning. It was my, it was, you don't know, last year, I was like, maybe, it really was, just a thought in my mind, maybe I could speak next year if things go well. Okay, here I am. I'm super excited about that. So thank you. I'm glad to answer any questions. We got a little bit of time here. Let's see, we got until five minutes. Yeah, we got five minutes. So, yes, ma'am. Could you walk us through a typical full day for you? Okay. Uh, depends on what day. <laughs> but typically, I'll say Monday. Monday's probably my favorite day. We wake up. Um, I'm getting up. I'm getting my projects ready. Just kind of helping to understand exactly what needs to be done over the course of that week. I'm going through, going over all my to-do lists, making sure that all my projects are on, on time. We have uh, kind of a staff meeting at 10. We go over all the projects, their current state, where they are, uh, what needs to be done that week, assigning those responsibilities. Then after that point, usually on Monday I have client meetings, so I'm going out talking with clients, uh, and then usually in the afternoon, by, usually lunch meetings. So after lunch I come home and I'll, I'll work on projects myself. So uh, depending on the project, I, I might do some work. On Tuesdays, I have a co-working membership at, at Level Downtown. I go down there, work all day. I think, but also in the mix with this, I do a lot of meetings, and that's part of what's saying, what don't I have time for? <laughs> okay, as I have more and more meetings, which are paying off for me, okay? And let me say, you know, this, this last month, I landed the biggest retainer that I've ever had, partly because I had invested in a relationship a year ago that I finally paid off, okay? So that's a long time, I know, to invest in that. But those, those meetings and talking with people, getting referrals, is mostly what I do, and then I do some of the development. Gather from something you said, you don't have any full time employees, per se, you just contractors. I was wondering if you could talk a little more about that, how you found them, how that works. Um, yeah, just from like from a business standpoint, technically, paperwork and working with them day to day. Yeah, um, luckily for me, all the people that work for me right now, I know personally. Um, some of them I've got to know this last year. So most of those came to me by referral. So as I was out there, everybody found out, you know, my friend's network was like, whoa, Wesley, Wesley lost his job. Okay, so that's like a big deal. So for them, what are you doing? I'm like, hey, after work camp, I'm like, I think I'm going to start a, a, a digital agency. Okay. 
hey, I know this person, I know that person. So it was networking through my existing network that led me to the people that work with me. Some of them, one of them, uh, Steve, I worked with him previously, and so I knew him. Now he has, everybody's got typically a full-time job, so this is something to do with their spare time. Um, and as things grow, yeah, I want to hire full-time employees. I'm not there yet because I need to make a full-time living for myself. Um, and not, not that that has to be a great, huge amount, uh, a big figure, but I need to, need to be there. So really for me, but my goal long-term is to do that. So, but for right now, I mean, whether you go online, um, Trevor actually is one of the guys that works in the inspector in the back. Um, find people in Upwork or some of those other sites where you can find and a lot of those people, all, the issue is a lot of those guys are overseas. So sometimes there's a language barrier. Or, and especially when you're talking design, like you need to really have good communication, I feel like, when you're talking about design. So. Yes, sir. I have a question about pricing. Uh, without getting into the nitty gritty of it, how do you negotiate like what's coming up front? You know, I know you have this struggle that you need money immediately and you're trying to start out full-time WordPress. So, like, how do you negotiate, like, when you're trying to get a new client, um, what comes up first and what comes later, and, you know, what you're offering, and what's like? I was wondering if you could elaborate on that. Yeah, I, I, when I had that first consultation meeting, which is part of was the reason I love to have those, is I get to know that client, I figure out exactly what their project is, not in extreme detail, but, but almost. And then I really understand, like I said, I, I kind of do more of a value-based pricing, which is I understand the value that I'm bringing to them, because if I'm going to make them a ton of money, I have a right to charge a little bit more, because it's more valuable for them. Now, I'm not talking about, I don't charge $10,000, okay, I'm not there. But I understand what the value is that I'm bringing to them. Also, in that meeting, I also help to communicate, I communicate that value to them. So I'm helping them understand how I'm going to help them. Here's the things that we could do. Here's that... And so it's through that relationship that I help them understand how I'm going to benefit them. I learn more about their project. And I go home and I think about it. I think, okay, you know what? I don't always do this right. I just blew a pretty decent job the other day because I overpriced it. Okay? <laughs> that happens too. But I think about it and I say, you know, if they're, they're at this level, they can afford to pay this. Okay? And I bring, I bring a lot to the table for them. So I'm going to adjust my price accordingly. So um, basically, I go back and I have proposal software, so I put it together. I have basic, a basic understanding of some standard rates that I charge, especially what my costs are to people that you know, do freelancing for me. So I have that established, so I can kind of do a basic estimate. How many hours is this going to take me? How many, how many hours is it going to involve from them? So I can get a good understanding of what my cost is going to be, and then I can kind of go up from there. So, yeah, cool. All right. All right. All right, I appreciate it. Thank you all very much. Thank you.